The name Azazel stirs up a lot of controversy across many texts of major religions. For one, there appears to be many variations of Azazel, from being an elusive spectre that receives a scapegoat full of sin from Aaron in Leviticus 16, from which the goat was cast down from in apocryphal biblical texts. Azazel also takes the form as the personification of evil and wickedness, some saying he is a demon in the desert, a demon who controls other goat demons, and even a leader of fallen angels in the Book of Enoch. In this video, I'll aim to dissect and explain the meaning of Azazel across several religious texts, and bring you some beliefs that many have regarding this elusive and mysterious entity. In the Bible, the term Azazel is used three times in Leviticus 16, where two male goats are sacrificed by Aaron in what would become known as the Day of Atonement. In Leviticus 16, the biblical God lays down some very specific instructions for Moses to tell Aaron that these two goats are to be marked as one to be sacrificed to him and one to be used as a scapegoat. When the first goat is sacrificed to God, the second is to be kept alive and brought before him, where Aaron is instructed to place his hand on the head of the goat and transfer all the sins of the Israelites by a confession, thus why the goat would become known as the scapegoat. The goat would then be taken to a remote place, with all of their sins embodied within itself, and be released into the wilderness of the desert. As can be seen in older versions of the Bible, the phrase Azazel does not appear at all. However, if we look at more modern translations, such as Leviticus 16.8, it reads, And Aaron is to cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and one lot for Azazel. By this, it means to show us that Azazel is another entity, one who is considered to be the polar opposite of the biblical god, possibly even an evil entity, hence why he is the one receiving the scapegoat with all the sin imbued with it. Furthermore, this translation sees Azazel mentioned again in Leviticus 16.10, where it reads, The goat which has been designated by Lot for Azazel is to be stood alive before the Lord, to make atonement on it by sending it away to Azazel in the wilderness. By this, we can understand that Azazel is an entity that lives in the wilderness, or the desert as some say, and that the goat he receives is a symbol, a symbolic representation of man casting away his past sins, and delivering them to where they belong, out with Azazel. While Azazel does not make another appearance within the Bible, some rabbis have deduced that the name Azazel itself gives away a clue as to its meaning. Azaz, meaning strong or rugged, and El, meaning God or of God, could be referring to the rugged cliff from which the goat was said to have been pushed by he who escorted it out of the desert in the Jewish text Yorma, which deals mainly with the Yom Kippur, otherwise known as the Day of Atonement in Judaism. In the Enochic literature, however, which are other Jewish religious texts that are rich with angels and demons, it tells us that Azazel was actually quite a prominent figure. He appears in the Book of Enoch, a book that details the fall of angels known as the Watchers. Before the Great Flood, the Watchers were angels that under God's instruction were to watch over mankind and see that all was well amongst humanity. However, in chapter 6 of the Book of Enoch, we are told that the children of men had multiplied, and that they had beautiful daughters, which were born unto the world. The angels saw these beautiful, mortal women, and lusted after them, and decided that they wanted them as wives, and wished to impregnate them with their own seed. It's understood that their leader was an angel known as Simjaza, or Simyaza, and in chapter 6 of Enoch, he actually tried to dissuade them from committing to such a plan, as he says, I fear God will not indeed agree to this deed, and I alone shall have to bear the penalty of a great sin. A less detailed version of this is also described in Genesis 6, 1-8, where we see the Watchers described simply as the sons of God, who were the heroes of old and men of renown. Genesis does not however attempt to show us the relationship between the sons of God or the Watchers, and the mortal women. It simply states that they had relations, and married those they chose to. The Book of Enoch states that the spawn between the Watchers and the mortal women were called the Nephilim, and while they are mentioned in Genesis 6 1-8, it is not detailed as to whether they are the spawn of the sons of God, 
or whether they had spawned from some other means. There is no indication in Genesis that these sons of God led humanity astray. However, in the Book of Enoch, the sons of God, the Watchers, are detailed as being malevolent as they ignore Simjaza's warning to leave the women alone and instead convince him to join in. They swear an oath that together they will take the mortal women and make them their own. A list of angels who committed this act are also detailed here, but amongst their names, Azazel does not appear, yet. After the Watchers have their way with the mortal women, the women give birth to giants, or Nephilim if you will. In chapter 7, the Book of Enoch details that these Watchers defiled the women and taught them charms and enchantments and taught them how to use plants for medicinal purposes. The Watchers revealed the secrets of heaven to these women, told them of the secrets of God and divulged sensitive information that mankind were not meant to be privy to. Furthermore, the giants which were born from these women turned against mankind and devoured them. Before long, they were openly killing birds, reptiles and fish before devouring one another's flesh and drinking each other's blood. By chapter 8, Azazel is mentioned and singled out as being the entity who taught men to make swords, knives, shields and breastplates. He taught them the metals of the earth and how to use them before leading them astray and corrupting their ways. While the leader Simjaza and the other watchers are noted in this chapter as teaching various things, it's interesting that Azazel is mentioned first and given a much longer and more aggressive subject to teach the mortals. While the others spoke about plants, the weather, astrology and the earth, Azazel is the only one noted as showing mankind the tools he might use for war and battle. He's also noted as the only angel to lead men away despite the other angels doing the exact same thing, though the subjects of their information is far more benign than swords and knives. Given that Azazel teaches man such an intense and detrimental topic, and given the fact that he is mentioned first in this chapter, many believe that Azazel is a leader of the Watchers, or at least high enough that he commands the same respect from the angels as Simjaza does. However, others dispute this, given that Azazel is not originally mentioned in chapter 6, where the main body of Watchers appear to be named. Others believe that it is here where Azazel achieves his fame, because he is the only one who broaches the subject of warfare with man. In chapter 9, Archangels Michael, Uriel, Raphael and Gabriel gaze down from heaven and see the destruction being caused on earth, courtesy of the trifling of the Watchers. What's interesting is that they are quick to blame Azazel, as they tell God, Thou seest what Azazel hath done, who hath taught all unrighteousness on earth, and revealed the eternal secrets which were preserved in heaven. They then accuse Simjaza of his crimes, stating that he had the authority over the watchers and should have known better. They state, They have gone to the daughters of men upon the earth, and have slept with the women, and have defiled themselves, and revealed to them all kinds of sin. And the women have borne giants, and the whole earth has thereby been filled with blood and unrighteousness. In chapter 10, God sends Archangel Uriel to Noah to tell him to hide thyself, and to reveal to him that the end is fast approaching, and that the whole world would need to be destroyed, thus leading on to the story of Noah and the flood. God also tells Archangel Raphael to bind Azazel hand and foot, and to cast him into the darkness, and make an opening in the desert, which is in Dudale, and cast him therein, and place upon him rough and jagged rocks, and cover him with darkness, and let him abide there for ever, and cover his face, that he may not see light, and on the day of the great judgment, he shall be cast into the fire, and heal the earth, which the angels have corrupted, and proclaim the healing of the earth, that they may heal the plague, and that all the children of men may not perish through all the secrets that the Watchers have disclosed and have taught to their sons. And the whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel, to him ascribe all sin. So as we can see, Azazel takes a chunk of the blame, as all sin is ascribed to him. This might likely be the case because, as I mentioned earlier, he's the only one out of all of the Watchers who discloses to man the secrets of weapons. 
Archangel Gabriel is sent forth by God to turn the giants against one another so that they might destroy each other. Meanwhile, Archangel Michael is sent to bind Sanjaza and the other Watchers for 70 generations, where they can watch their sons destroy each other before being cast into the abyss of fire on their day of judgement. Azazel is mentioned again in chapter 13, where Enoch himself, now established as a scribe in chapter 12, is told to go to the Watchers and reprimand them, saying, Ye have wrought great destruction on the earth, and ye shall have no peace nor forgiveness of sin. And then as much as they delight themselves in their children, the murder of their beloved ones shall they see, and over the destruction of their children shall they lament, and shall make supplication unto eternity, but mercy and peace shall ye not attain. He then singles out Azazel in chapter 13, saying, Azazel, thou shalt have no peace. A severe sentence has gone forth against thee to put thee in bonds, and thou shalt never have toleration nor request granted to thee because of the unrighteousness that thou hast taught, and because of all the works of godliness and unrighteousness and sin which thou hast shown to men. Here Enoch is essentially clarifying to both Azazel and the reader that the fallen watcher will never have peace, and that his motives against mankind have damned him to a severe sentence that will see him in bonds. By chapter 53, Enoch describes an event of which he is taken to another part of earth and beholds a deep valley burning with fire. He asks what he describes as the angel of peace as to what is going on, to which the angel replied that the fires he saw were being prepared for the host of Azazel, thus alluding to the ultimate fate of the fallen watcher. In the third book of Enoch, sometimes abbreviated as Three Enoch, we see Rabbi Ishmael ascend to the heavens where he sees God and meets some of his angels, one who goes by the name Metriton. In the third book of Enoch 4.2, Rabbi Ishmael asks Metatron who he is, to which Metatron replies that he is actually Enoch, or at least once was, and that God had saved him and brought him into heaven during the days of the Great Flood. Metatron goes on to tell Rabbi Ishmael that when he arrived in the heaven as Enoch, Azazel was there, along with two other angels, Azza and Uzza, as noted in Book of Enoch 3, 4, 6. Despite having been judged by God in Book of Enoch 1, and bound by Archangel Raphael, there is either a discrepancy in the text, or that God allowed Azazel back into heaven at some point. Azazel detests Enoch's ascension to heaven, as well as his transformation into an angel, but God silences him and tells him in reference to Enoch, I delight in this one more than all of you, and hence he shall be prince and a ruler over you in the high heavens. This shows us that though Azazel, if not destroyed or bound in the book of Enoch 1, submits to Enoch in his angelic form, and does not appear to be mentioned again, implying his subservience is now absolute. This is furthermore confirmed in the third book of Enoch 4.9, where Enoch as Metatron states, Forthwith all stood up, and went out to meet me, prostrated themselves before me, and said, Happy art thou, and happy is thy father, for thy creator doth favour thee. Another text known as the Apocalypse of Abraham, an extra-canonical piece of Jewish literature, in the first century, tells us that Azazel is portrayed as an unclean bird who sabotages a sacrifice constructed by Abraham. In the Apocalypse of Abraham 13, 6 through 14, Abraham is traveling with an angel who tells him to conduct a sacrifice in honor of God. But as he does, Abraham tells us that a bird descends upon the sacrifice and tells him to abandon the sacrifice and to leave the angel for this angel intends to burn the land and destroy him. Abraham turns to the angel and asks for an explanation. But the angel replies in 13.7, This is ungodliness. This is Azazel. He then turns his attention towards Azazel the bird and tells him, Disgrace upon you, Azazel, for Abraham's lot is in heaven, but yours is upon earth, because you have chosen and loved this for the dwelling place of your uncleanness. By this, it can be assumed that the angel may have been referring to the times of Enoch, where Azazel amongst his watchers descended upon the earth, and chose it as his grounds for which to mate with the women and teach humanity wickedness. 
The angel goes on to say in a long rant against Azazel that he cannot lead Abraham astray as Abraham is his enemy. He also tells Azazel in 13.14, the rest which is in heaven was formerly yours has been set aside for Abraham and the mortality which was his has been transferred to you. By this, we understand that Azazel was indeed once a part of heaven, furthermore linking this with the Book of Enoch. However, we also understand that he has now been cast out, possibly bound as suggested in Enoch by Archangel Raphael, and that in his bondage, he has become more like the mortals, powerless and weak as Abraham takes his place. What's interesting about this piece is that we actually do see Abraham setting up a sacrifice to God in Genesis 15.11, and that birds do indeed descend upon the sacrifice, as if to tarnish it. However, Abraham is not noted as driving them away, much as Azazel is driven away in the Apocalypse of Abraham. We later to see the angel and Abraham ascend to heaven in chapter 23, where Abraham meets God and gets to see the fall of Adam and Eve play before his eyes. However, he also sees a mysterious entity between Adam and Eve lurking behind the tree. In 23, 7 through 8, Abraham describes the entity, saying, Standing behind the tree was one who had the aspect of a serpent, having hands and feet like those of a man, and wings on its shoulders, six pairs of wings, so that there were six wings on the right and six on the left. In chapter 23, 9 through 12, Abraham asks God, Who are these who are embracing, and who is the one between them who is behind the tree? And what is the fruit that they are eating? To which God replies, This is the counsel of the world. This one is Adam, and this one, who is their desire upon the earth, is Eve. But he who is between them represents ungodliness, and their beginnings on the way to perdition, Azazel himself. By this, we understand that Azazel in this story is the serpent who tempted Eve, and that Azazel is essentially instrumental in the downfall of man. This appears to be one of the only texts that describe Azazel in such detail, though it is also interesting that Abraham sees more than just the serpent that is traditionally depicted, but also sees this serpent with wings, hands and feet, perhaps maintaining some of his angelic features from a time when he was one of God's angels. God then tells Abraham between chapters 28 and 32 of the judgement that man will receive in the end times and that an entity known simply as a man, or the relief, will appear from the side of the pagans, and will be worshipped by the pagans and by Azazel himself. Abraham actually sees this man in a vision produced by God, where the man is beaten, insulted, and struck. But Abraham is most stricken when he sees Azazel kiss the man on the face, and proceeds to stand behind him, implying that even Azazel reveres this man. And as I watched, I saw Azazel approach him, and he kissed him on the face, and then stood behind him. God explains that this man is the Messiah, a man sent to fight the enemies of God, and to inspire hope and betterment in people, whilst also seeking to amass a following of people, who will be like him and worship him. While in biblical accounts, Jesus is commonly dubbed as being the Messiah, but he is never actually named here in the Apocalypse of Abraham. However, there is a shrewd observation that in Luke 22:48, Judas betrays Jesus by identifying him to the authorities with a kiss. Much like Azazel is noted as supplying the Messiah with a kiss, an interesting parallel can be drawn between the two cases, implying that the Messiah, or the man known as the Relief in the Apocalypse of Abraham, is actually Jesus, and Judas is actually Azazel. In the final chapters of the Apocalypse of Abraham, we see Azazel mentioned once more, as God tells Abraham that the wicked in the end times will putrefy in the belly of the crafty worm Azazel, and be burned by the fire of Azazel's tongue. The idea here is that God shows Abraham a sign of things to come, that much of the world becomes stricken with evil, and that many choose to side with Azazel, or follow in his evil footsteps. But through this, we understand that God and Azazel become something along the sort of rivals, one being good and the other being bad. It appears by this that God and Azazel are sharing the same world, 
but that in the end times, God will see to those that have followed Azazel are burned by him. In this, Azazel becomes comparable to Satan, or could simply be another term used for Satan in that he opposes God and seeks to corrupt man. Azazel does not appear to be officially mentioned in the Quran, although many Islamic interpreters believe that Azazel written as Azazel was the name of the devil before he was expelled from the heavens. Some believers hold on to the idea that Azazel was an archangel, but contrarily was also a jinn, an evil spirit or a demon in the Islamic faith. Exegesis such as the Tafsir and the stories of the prophecies seem to tell us that Azazel was something of a hybrid between jinn and angel. Further ideas by scholars who have studied the Sahaba suggest that before the Islamic devil Iblis was cast out from heaven for his refusal to bow to Adam, Iblis was known as Azazel. Some theories from these ideas include that Azazel was an angel who loses his position due to his refusal to bow to Adam, or that he was originally a jinn that earned God's favour and was welcomed into heaven, or that he was sent to earth to terminate the jinn. It seems that in all of these cases, Azazel grows arrogant, and at the point of being asked to bow before Adam, he refuses every time, believing that as an angel, he is superior to humans. In another tale, a companion of a prophet claimed that the jinn were once angelic creatures who descended upon earth to observe humanity, but became entranced by the women. It would lead them to sexual deviancy, the drinking of wine, and even murder, a story that sounds awfully similar to the Watchers in the Book of Enoch. Supposedly, Azazel was one of these angels but that he turned away from the sinful ways of his companions and devoted himself to God. Meanwhile, a group of Muslim philosophers from 8th century Iraq, known as the Brethren of Purity or the Brethren of Serenity, suggested that Azazel was a jinn from earth, but was captured by angels. However, he would impress upon the angels because of his strong moral compass and willingness to do good. He was brought before God and made one of his angels, until again, he was brought before Adam, to whom he refused to bow before, causing him to be cast out. A 9th century Persian poet named Al-Halaj recorded in a collection of stories known as the Tawasin that there were various theories about Azazel even back then. He notes that Azazel was known as Iblis only after his fall from grace, and that Azazel was charged with a mission in heaven and a mission on earth. His mission on heaven was to preach to the angels and to show them good works. However, on earth, he preached to men about jinn, showing them evil deeds. Essentially, what this tells us is that Azazel was actually good intentioned. He showed the angels the way of goodness and told them that if they did these things, they would be rewarded. However, when he went to earth, he only showed them the bad things and essentially told them, don't do these things because you won't be rewarded. Without being told the good things, man had no comparison between good and evil, he simply only knew evil, and therefore did not know right from wrong. By this argument, the evil spread by Azazel is not through malice, but merely through neglectful explanation. Al-Halaj also explains some intricacies about the name Azazel, notably breaking down the phonics of the word and what he believes each syllable to represent. He finally ends by detailing the argument between Azazel and God where Azazel tells God that he cannot understand how he expects him to bow before Adam, who was made from earth, and he was made from fire. He even declares himself as a martyr before God, before he is banished, and eventually returned to the flames from which he was spawned. Azazel is mentioned in a whole range of religious texts, most of them non-canonical, but certainly interesting reads nonetheless. Unfortunately, there also exists what I've determined to be a lot of fanciful fiction spewed out from so-called scholars and translators that seek to paint Azazel in a certain light, despite their claims not being backed up by any real religious source. A lot of these are accounts or simply interpretations, most of them modern ones, and there might be things that I have left out of this video simply because I could not find substantial evidence for. In any case, if you think I've missed something crucial, then feel free to let me know in the comments below and let me know what you think about the term or character of Azazel. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's video, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up, 
and don't forget to subscribe. Until the next time, guys.